Hello everyone, happy Thursday. Um, our main plan for today is to finish up talking about William's um, little thing on morality and the amoralist. Um, we're about to get to the like, the real, like a lot of this uh, we talked about so far is set up. Now we're actually going to get to it. Um, I did want to answer your question, Julius, uh, for everybody. Um, so Julius asks, have you gotten any info on how the start of the new quarter will go? Is it too early to tell? Um, I have not received any official word. Um, and if I did, I probably would let you know. <laughs> um, but I, nothing, I haven't gotten any official communications from the school yet about what the plan is for next quarter. However, um, just in terms of my speculations here and what I'm, what I'm guessing about, it's just a guess, but I think it's pretty reasonable to operate under the assumption that at least at the start of the quarter, next quarter, it will still be online only. I have a hard time imagining that in the next couple of weeks, circumstances change and to such a degree that the reasons why it's moved to online suddenly are no longer relevant or something like that. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm gearing up for it. I'm like, I'm getting ready for like, okay, these classes are all going to be online, um, at least to start the quarter. Um, the more that there's like some some other clues to me about even before any other news happened, that's kind of what I was thinking, but... Like, the NBA just shut down the entire rest of its season. Um, like, all the games are canceled and everything. Oh, awesome, Helena. Good, good. Um, so the fact that the NBA is doing something like that and just, like, canceling the entire rest of their season um, makes me think, you know, the school will also feel like, yeah, opening up classes again just doesn't make, make sense to do. Um, I do think that... Um, and, and not to be alarmist or anything here about this, but my I think the reasonable assumption, if we're looking at the the um, the circumstances of what's been going on in say other countries that were getting infections before we did in America, um, it's reasonable to expect it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, that it, it isn't the the you know, whenever infection rates happen, they, they uh, increase in these exponential ways. And then there's a point, it's, uh, in math it's called the, in statistics it's called the inflection point, where instead of it having this exponential growth, it tapers off and then starts, you know, the growth reaches some limits and then, and then you know, starts uh, falling again. Um, <clears throat> and that, I don't think we're at the inflection point yet. So it might be a case of like hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Um, and I think uh, in terms of being prepared, it's it's pretty reasonable to be gearing up and expecting um, an online format. Does that um, anything else I can help with with on that, um, Julius? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so um, I also got a, a question from Bernadette, um, just to get a reminder of the difference between uh, immoralists and amoralists, and and that'd be good to do. So let's let's do that to kind of get back going with um, Williams here, finishing it up, um, because of just the time of the quarter it is too. If if anyone in chat today has um, questions about end of quarter, what's going to be happening, stuff with the paper project. Any of that kind of big picture stuff, I, I still kind of like I said earlier yesterday, I want to keep opening up our time together here as being another place to get questions like that answered. It's a very valuable space for that because I don't have to just talk one on one with every single person. But if you've got a question, chances are someone else has that same question and then I can answer it for everybody too. So um, oftentimes things, if it's like a really specific question about your paper, then maybe that's something for a one on one conversation. But anything that is general or about the expectations or parameters of how things are going to work, I'd love to get those uh, questions answered for everybody. Um, so don't be shy about dropping things into the chat here. And um, and if you got questions about related to the Williams reading too, drop them in into the chat, even if it doesn't feel like the right time. And I can weave it into my lecture too, if you've got some questions here. Hudson says, when should we get that video for our outline? Uh, you should have it already. Um, if it's graded, then you've got the video. Um, and I, I think yours is graded. Uh, here, let me check. 
Okay, so uh, it sounds like some, some more people have had questions about getting their video feedback for their paper outline. So um, as I mentioned before, the, the way I'm doing this is I post a comment on your assignment um, that it says like, here's a link to your a video with comments and feedback for you. I usually say something like, I hope it's helpful or sorry for recording such a long video or something like that. Um, and then there's a, a private YouTube link. So um, if, if I, Canvas didn't automatically send you notification, the standard default settings are that if I post a comment on your work, then you get a notification by email for it, but you might have your settings on Canvas set up maybe a little differently. Go to the assignment where you uploaded your, your outline and you should see a little comment from me. And if you can't find it with that description, let me know and I can find some other more direct way to, to give you the link to, to let you get access to it. Um, and uh, another question, um, was I correct in hearing that we're grading someone else's paper outline? If so, should I have gotten someone's? Yes. Um, so that's the response paper assignment, uh, which was already due uh, last weekend, I believe. Um, and I emailed out uh, anonymous drafts for people, uh, or the anonymous outlines for people to review. So if you don't, uh, if you didn't, you don't have access to that, Helena, let maybe we can, after class is over here. Um, I can look that up in my email system and forward it to you again or something like that. Yeah. Any any other questions? Yeah, so stick around, Helena, and we'll get that sorted out. Um, let me double check that too. Um, or maybe maybe we can do that after class, Hudson. So uh, if you're wondering about particular cases, just stick around. I'll be here. I'm not going to be bolting after class is officially over and we can sort out any of these uh, mysteries, any of these loose threads. I have been getting some of the response papers late through email, and I've received them, and I've been passing them along uh, to the, the original authors anonymously. Uh, they're not all graded yet, so if you, if you gave it to me through email, then it probably doesn't show up on Canvas. But I probably have it. But it wouldn't hurt to double check. That'd be good. Anything else people are wondering about? These are good questions. Do I prefer uh, uh, assignments and responses set through Canvas rather than email? Yes. Um, uh, to upload them to the Canvas assignments when there's the option to do so is preferable. Uh, if it's sent through email, I can deal with that, so that's that's okay. Just a slight preference for convenience uh, to do it on Canvas if possible. Uh, Christian, I saw you're, you you were typing for a second. Did you have something you wanted to ask? Oh, I was lagging, but it's good. Okay, cool. All right. Um, if there is anything else, drop it in the chat. I'll address it. If you've got anything about Williams that you're curious about or you're hoping to hear about in today's lecture, drop it in there too. I might be planning on doing it already, but um, never hurts to throw it out there. And if I wasn't going to do it, then I can integrate it into the lecture. But uh, let's pick up with Bernadette's question. So just another like recap here about the difference between amoralism and immoralism. So uh, we, let's actually imagine three people, because I'll use the, I'll use this term too. You've got a moralist, you have the immoralist, and then you have the amoralist. And these are abstract definitions. They are categories that in, have an incredible amount of diversity that exists within them. But a moralist is someone who just believes that um, moral considerations do have a legitimate and maybe obligatory influence on decision making, on appropriate decision making, that you ought to follow the oughts of morality. Um, morality should be a factor here in deciding how to act and how to live. Um, and 
we can maybe distinguish the moralist from an immoralist just in the sense that the the immoralist is still a moralist because they still believe that they're still making decisions based on moral considerations but we can definitely in thinking about playing the moral game and worried about doing it badly one way you could screw it up is by having the wrong moral beliefs so making the wrong decisions like someone thinks they're doing what's right what they believe to be right and they could be wrong about that just because someone believes that they're doing the right thing doesn't mean they are in fact doing the right thing I mean I'm sure you have some this is not a new idea I'm sure this is somewhat familiar if you ever are wondering like am I doing the right thing like I think this is what's right or these are what my values are but should I have these values like if you critically rethink that you're recognizing there's the possibility of getting it wrong and the immolus would just be someone who's getting it wrong um, but that person even if they're wrong in their moral beliefs values and principles um, they still are playing the moral game they still recognize the appropriateness of morality as guiding action um, but there's a disagreement over which principles are the right ones right and there's the possibility of error all of that exploring that would be behind that gate I was talking about the gate of like okay so morality matters now the next question is what is moral like what does morality actually ask for what is it sensitive to what are what are the the fundamental values of morality that's what ethical theory is all about and then we have some debates about that like who is the immoralist is an interesting question among moralists people who are like yep let's play the moral game that's the right thing to do this is what's rationally justified to do they give a positive answer to the question why be moral in contrast with both of them is the amoralist the amoralist is someone who just doesn't think the moral game matters and what I was saying yesterday is sort of interesting about the amoralist is they could be really knowledgeable about morality they could have the correct moral beliefs you know theoretically without actually thinking that they're relevant for action so the the amoralist could know what morality demands but just not act on it <laughs> you know like um like deadpool oh man no <laughs> i don't think so um i don't think deadpool is an amoral character uh i'm not very deep into the deadpool comic books um I, i'm not a big comic book person uh i like manga a lot more uh, honestly but um from what I've seen of Deadpool, Deadpool is still sort of chaotic good or something. Like he's got, um, he he is responsive to moral considerations. Let's put it that way. Um, if you look at uh, Deadpool's role in, say, Marvel Civil War, that arc of storytelling, I read Marvel Civil War after students talking to me about it over and over again. It's a moral drama, this kind of thing, right? Um, He's, he's responsive to moral concerns. There's just some things that he doesn't, he's not impressed with as moral concerns or he sort of is chaotic and doesn't always respect rules or something like that. But morality is not restricted to conventional rules of society or anything like that. Um, it's about something bigger than that. It, it's kind of like how the law doesn't establish what is moral. The, the morality is above the law. Laws, you can have laws for things, but they can be unjust laws. The laws can't self, they can't give themselves their own authority. They can be instruments of power, but they are not self-sufficient for justice. So instead of saying the law determines what's moral, it's morality that determines what laws we ought to have. That's, that's the way it would work. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So um, let's talk a little bit more about the amoralist here. So the basic definition, we're, and we, we got a lot to cash out in terms of what they are. Like I was uh, anticipating or, or foreshadowing yesterday, figuring out who the amoralist actually is. Like what are the conditions to meet uh, in order to be the amoralist is actually a little tricky. Um, but our, our sort of pre-theoretical notion that gets us in the ballpark here is that the moralist is one, is a person for whom they're not playing the moral game at all. They're not participating with moral considerations as a part of deciding how to act and how to live. They just don't have any truck with that whatsoever. Um, so 
they and they like i said they may know what is moral i have met some ethicists that i think are maybe not straight strict amoralists but they're pretty gosh darn close in fact my undergrad my first undergrad advisor before he left the college um i kind of think about in this regard uh he was like really knowledgeable about ethical theory and then he'd sh share these personal anecdotes from his life and i was just like how are you an ethicist <laughs> right so just like someone could be playing the moral game but be having the wrong idea of what morality asks for you could have someone who has the right idea of what morality asks for and just it doesn't factor into their decision making um there may be some people who are in a in a weird gray area here where they may uh this kind of goes back to the williams nagel discussion about what does it mean to authentically hold a belief you can imagine people sort of being moralists in name only in like word only they say that they value all these things um, that these are their moral principles that these are their moral values and they but it never translates into action so they might be for all practical purposes an amoralist what's actually determining their decisions is not their moral beliefs they've got the moral beliefs but they're just kind of up in the attic they never come out right? they're never used or deployed in any actual case of acting in which case we might say that person is an amoralist too that um, to play the moral game, it's not sufficient to say that you subscribe to moral beliefs, but it has to somehow have some bearing on what you actually do. Um, that's a little controversial, but um, I, maybe that also helps in just uh, getting a, a rough sketch here of what makes the amoralist different from the immoralist. Is this helping you, Bernadette? You're the one who asked about it, but uh, anybody, is this making sense? Awesome. Okay. Cool. Alrighty. Um, I'm a little surprised. Uh, Deadpool is, I guess, is not a total surprise, but the the person I, I usually get, the fictional character that students often ask me about, is the Joker. The Joker is a much more sort of interesting or compelling case example for thinking about like, do they qualify or not? And the Joker has been presented in so many different ways in different movies and comic books and television shows and stuff like that. Um, and I think most of the time the Joker would not qualify as an amoralist, but there's definitely some things that are leaning in that direction. But maybe after we talk about what Williams is going to say here for defining it, you'll be able to see this um, this going on. And I, I just for the record, I have not seen the newest Joker movie. I don't watch movies anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> My life just doesn't give me much space for it. Um, but um, yeah, that's been it's been on my list. But um, but yeah, uh, most of the presentations of the Joker I've seen, especially um, uh, the um, Heath Ledger version, doesn't seem to really qualify as amoral. Maybe closer to immoral. So it, it's going to be important differentiating those things. Like we said, a lot of things that might seem to be the amoralist are actually maybe just going to be the immoralist. Um, okay, so early stabs here at sorting out and bringing into focus, what does it take to be an amoralist? First thing, no moral considerations. They can't, when they're deciding what to do, there can't be any factors here of moral values. So... Uh, they can, here's a, here's a big concession, they can still have preferences and aims. So it's not like an amoralist is just an inert agent. <laughs> they don't make decisions for any reasons. They can have reasons. They can have things that they prefer, things that they don't prefer, um, and they can be pursuing projects. There's things that they could be devoted to. They can make judgments about what they think is good, like what's valuable. Like the amoralist could value money, they could value all sorts of things, right? But we do have to say that there's a certain set of values or preferences that are kind of off limits to them if they're going to retain their status of being an amoralist because those preferences or those values are intrinsically moral in character. So things like valuing promise keeping. If you value promise keeping, you are a moralist, right? The whole idea of promise making and promise keeping has the concepts of, of duties or obligations to them that's moral territory right um what about loyalty that's a little tricky like think about um 
something like the Godfather, right? A mafia boss. A mafia boss could be an amoralist. They could also just be an immoralist, right? Um, if they put, if they treat loyalty as something like a, um, an aspect, a, a, a virtue, a, a character trait that like brings dignity to a person or something like that, or makes them more worth consideration, now that would be kind of playing a moral game about it. But you could also imagine someone valuing loyalty just because they want power, right? They want loyalty out of people because they want power and control over them. That's not necessarily a moral aim, okay? So that could be compatible with amoralism. But see how it can be kind of sticky, sorting out what's playing the moral game versus not? I mean, that's going to be a little tricky. Um, Michael asks, the reasons would just be subjective when we're talking about preferences. No, that's probably not the best way to think about it. Because, and here's the reason why, moral considerations can have an element of subjectivity to them as well. This is about different flavors of subjectivity, the kind of subjectivity that involves moral concepts and moral principles, and the kind of subjectivity that doesn't. Okay, that, that, so subjectivity is too broad of a brush to be carving out these two different areas. Um, some, some moralists believe in transcendental moral facts, right? Things that are sort of uh, beyond any subjectivity. Um, but most of the moral theories that we actually have on offer are more, they're less like the realist, if you're thinking relativism and realism, and more like the subjectivist position. They're like, yeah, moral matters are subjective. They're about a subject, a person who's going to be doing an action, an agent. Morality is about that. It's about choice. Choice is always subjective. But there could also be objectivity in it as well. So kind of a recurring theme in this class is that subjectivity and objectivity are not mutually exclusive ideas. They, you can have objectivity within subjectivity. That can happen. Um, is that making sense to you, Michael? Yep. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Keep these questions coming. I, I'm, I, I, we've been doing the online thing for a while now, and I'm just like, ah, I miss being in class together. It's so great to be able to see your faces and have opportunity for conversation. Um, so let's try to make the best of it. Um, I, I love it every time you're contributing. So um, do as much as, as you want here. Okay, so we're trying to be careful about what preferences and aims that are compatible with amoralism, and which preferences and aims were you to have them, that would put you into the category of being a moralist. Again, keeping in mind that, you know, the kinds of moral values that you have, they could be moral in character even if they're wrong, making you the immoralist. Okay, so here's another very, very important um, conceptual boundary for defining true amoralism. You would have to leave out of our conception of the amoralist any kind of formal criteria of, of, of appropriateness or universal judgment. Something like, um, like take this kind of excuse. Well, it's okay for these people to do it, so it's okay for me to do it. All right, so if these people are allowed to do it, then I'm allowed to do it. That's a notion of what is permissible or what actions are permitted. And the whole idea of that is that permitted within a set of criteria from morality about what you ought to be doing and what you ought not to be doing. So much of the, the logical space of ethics is figuring out which actions are consistent with morality and which ones are crossing a red line. Which actions are impermissible versus the things that are permissible. So there can be actions for which um, it's like you must do this or you must never do this, things like that. Um, and and we're, again, not generalizing behavior. We can contextualize it to particular situations, like um, never buy a beer for your friend if they're an alcoholic, right? We could do something like that. Um, it's not saying never buy beer for anybody, but under those circumstances, this is wrong, right? That's a that's a violation of your obligation of care for them, or something like that. enabling something that's uh, morally harmful um, is not a good thing to do. You can't do it. But there can be whole other spaces of permissibility, um, and to say that it's okay to do those things or to choose between any of them is, uh, is still a moral claim. So what is okay to do is to make a moral judgment, right? So this, uh, oftentimes I get this kind of response from people. Um, 
morality takes away your freedom. And if we were going to believe in objective, universal, moral truth, then that means everyone's got to be exactly the same. And that would be a boring world and blah, 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 blah. Maybe you've heard this kind of line before, sound familiar? Maybe even are sympathetic to it. Sound familiar? Okay. So, first thing is, I think we might have talked about this before. Morality doesn't take away your freedom. It presupposes it. It's saying, you do have freedom to choose. Here's what you should do with your choice, right? Um, and just because we say you have freedom to do something, doesn't mean everything you do with that freedom is permissible. So, like, for example, just because we have freedom of speech, that would be like, it's good to let people have the freedom to express themselves in public, doesn't mean that everything that you do with your freedom of speech is like ethically ideal or appropriate, right? There could be, uh, even if it's not illegal, uh, or even if the government would should not be regulating something, doesn't mean that that whole space is immune to any kind of moral consideration. So that's one point. The other point is that depending on what the shape of morality actually looks like, like what is it that morality actually demands or asks of us, there could be a huge range of diversity of lives that are moral lives, that are like consistent with those objective, absolute moral rules. Like imagine, for instance, the only moral rule was don't murder people. That was the only moral rule. I don't think that that's true. Morality is not that simple. It's way more complicated than that, but just as a thought experiment. Imagine that's the case. That means any actions that don't involve murdering people are permissible. So people could be really different. Yes, we could still hurt others, and that's probably why we need to have more moral rules other than just don't murder people. But as we make that more and more complex, there's still going to be a room of permissibility of like a range of lives that are consistent with moral values. So it's not like if we all agreed, if we were all on the same page, we, are, we had a perfectly just world, a utopian world in terms of moral standards, that we would all be like stormtrooper clones or something. That we'd live exactly the same lives. I'm wearing my uh, IDIC hat today. In infinite diversity and infinite combinations that can still be bounded or restricted by, say, a moral law. Um, so whatever, the, whatever kind of moral theory people have, unless it is defined specifically to say this and this way only, this, this very particular, we're going to define it down to all the details, is the only form of life that is morally acceptable. Most moral theories are like, here's where the fences are, but within those fences, there's still a lot of room for people doing different things. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so the, the reason I got on this whole tangent is because any notion of permissibility, of something being okay to do, is actually a moral judgment. So the amoralist can't even think in these terms. They can't say, uh, it, you're, in other words, you're not an amoralist just by rejecting that you are under any moral obligations. If you say there are no moral obligations, everything is permitted, that's a moral position. You're making a claim about the moral landscape with an eye towards how that's going to influence or inform what actions to take. Right? You're still you're still playing a moral game. Now that that kind of like I don't even know the name to put for this. Uh, there's one person in history I don't even want to mention his name because I don't think he's worth studying. He's kind of I don't know toxic. It's a 19th century dude. Not I'm not a fan. anyway. It's very rare to find someone who actually d holds this position that their moral perspective or their moral theory is that everything is permitted. It'd be kind of like a moral anarchy. Um, you know, like anarchists in, in the political discussion are against any form of government regulation. There shouldn't be any government order or social order whatsoever. Um, that means everything is wide open, right? Everything is unregulated. Um, if you imagine that from morality, like there are no moral boundaries, all actions are permissible, do what you will is the only moral rule, um, that would be kind of like the anarchy metaphor. Um, but that is still a position about the nature of morality and how that would influence action. So the amoralist, like we were saying before, they could understand morality. They could be like, the morally right thing to do is this. There's moral obligations here, here, and here. They can accept that, but still not act on it. <laughs> Right? Or not think that that's compelling or relevant or anything like that. Um, 
and he says, I'm sorry, Skype was being stupid and not letting me join, but basically an amoralist is uh, an irony because even their position is based on the moral idea that there are no boundaries. No, the amoralist doesn't give a shit. They don't care whether their actions are crossing boundaries or are permitted. They just don't, they don't, they're not, they don't care how that debate shakes out. They, they don't even maybe attempt to define what the moral landscape are of like what's permitted, what's obligatory. But even if they like remark on it, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, that's what, that's a, a good person would do that. A morally good person would do that. But I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to do whatever I want. They could recognize that they're crossing a boundary um, and still they're, they can still be the amoralist. Does that make sense? How's everyone else doing about this too? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay, so the amoralist is just someone who sort of doesn't care about morality. They don't care what turns out to be permitted or impermissible. That whether th something is permissible or not just is not a. It's a non-factor. It's not a variable. Okay. Um, so here's a here, another uh, sort of edge case. Um, there are, there are some attitudes that maybe are so moral in character that while we can imagine the amoralist having all sorts of preferences and aims and projects and things that they care about, they can't care about these things if they're going to stay in the amoral category. If they started having these attitudes, then they are pretty much in the moral category. There's a really, really famous paper um, in contemporary moral psychology called, uh, what is it? Uh, um, resentment and something. Oh, man, I'm a bad academic. I can't remember Freedom and Resentment, I think that's the name of it. Um, and that was by... Uh, not Scanlon. Um, I'm blanking. I'm blanking. Oh, man, I'm a terrible academic. I'm sorry, everyone. Anyway, Freedom and Resentment, very famous paper uh, on, in moral psychology about identifying what are sort of the essential attitudes of morality, the sort of psychological attitudes that characterize morality. And, um, oh, the name is on the tip of my tongue right now. I was about to say, he says, I almost had his name there for a second. Shit. Oh, man, this is going to drive me nuts. I'm sorry. I know I'm wasting time. This is a distraction. But I, I want to know. I'm doing a little Google search. This is going to be one of those things that once I see it, I'm going to be like, what? How did I forget that? Um, Strassen! God damn it, yes. Yeah. Uh, Peter Strassen, 1962. Okay, so still contemporary as far as philosophy is concerned. Yes, yes, Peter Strassen. Um, okay, so Strassen, in this paper, says there's a big difference between... Um, a certain attitude and then a familiar cousin of that feeling or emotion or attitude that one of them is moral in character and the other is not. So he identifies resentment specifically as a essentially moral attitude. So um, take for instance, uh, this I usually do this demonstration in class and it makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Let's say I imagine we're still in the classroom and I'm getting really excited and jumping around while I'm giving my lecture. And then I'm, I step on your foot accidentally. You're sitting in the front row, and I step on your foot. And initially, you, know, you have the pain in your foot, and you're like, you're like let's say you have like a, a reaction. Okay? You might just be like, ow! But let's say you're like, mm, you kind of get worked up. Okay? You could be angry at me for stepping on your foot. That's not a moral attitude. So amoralists could have feelings like that. They could be like, uh... These other people are treating me a certain way, and I don't like it. And that doesn't mean you're playing a moral game. But let's say you resent me for doing it. You're like, I'm going to remember this one. All right. I take a, a special kind of posture or attitude that comes, Strassen argues, comes from how I'm judging you shouldn't have done that. You violated some kind of like moral boundary. You made a wrong choice. And as evidence that it has this kind of moral character to it, Strassen kind of 
I, I'm playing around with a, an example case here, but he basically talks about the same thing in principle. So if I step on your foot, you get a little angry, and then I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that, it was an accident. You might still be angry at me for stepping on your foot, but you're not going to resent me for it. You're not going to think, um, oh, you know, I'm going to hold a moral grudge against this person or something like that. Okay? In contrast with another case, let's say I look you in the eyes and I step on your foot. Where it's like very clear, I did this intentionally, um, I did this as a free choice. Now you're going to take a different sort of attitude about it. That, you know, the, once you recognize, oh, it was an accident, Tim's just clumsy or something, you might be like, I'm annoyed by his clumsiness, but I'm not going to hold it a, as a grudge against him personally. But when it comes to these cases where you, it is intentional action, it's like a relational gesture that I stepped on your foot, and then you resent me for it, that is accompanied always, Strawson thinks, with a sort of embedded, like the attitude itself has like an embedded moral judgment in it. Um, that it requires a, a set of standards of what you ought to have done with your freedom and that you didn't use your, your freedom in the way you morally ought to. Okay, so um, Williams is kind of picking up on this line of thinking and saying, yeah, so those specific attitudes that involve um, the, the moral attitudes, those are things that the amoralist can't, can't play around with. So the, the amoralist basically can't take stuff personally in this moralized sense. They can... Um, they can resist people who are going against their purposes. They can be annoyed by people and frustrated by them because they want to do what they're trying to do and these people are getting in the way of them. Right? They may be annoyed at moralists who are trying to restrict their actions that are violating moral norms or something, but they can't treat those people as, as if they're doing something wrong. Right in in any kind of moral or ethical sense, they can't judge them. They can't be judgmental in this sort of way. The amoralist, if they do that, now they're playing a moral game, maybe with different rules than the other people that they're judging who are playing by a moral game. But they they are now playing a moral game themselves. Does that make sense? This little piece of the puzzle clicking into place. Mm hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you for the feedback. That's very much appreciated. I can't look at your faces and read the room. Although sometimes that's not a foolproof method, but it's something. <laughs> I'm just seeing my own face. All right. So the fact that there could be, um, that there there's no notion of like universal standards here about what's permitted and what's not permitted is, is really an essentially defining aspect of what makes the a moralist what they are. Very, very, very important. And this is what I was alluding to earlier, I think, this week on Monday's lecture or something about how this idea of making universal judgments is a big defining feature of playing a moral game. Um, talking about what you ought to do, or like considerations for action, imagined as like a fair standard for everybody, or that we're going to hold other people accountable to as well as for ourselves. This is really distinctly playing the moral game. So making, making value judgments, but asserting them on, on a kind of universal playing field as a standard to hold people's choices accountable to, that's the moral game. That's the moral game. And kind of like when we were talking about Nagel and Williams, to, to not do that kind of means not playing the moral game. Remember when Nagel was talking about, like, if you really hold a moral belief, but you're not willing to apply it universally, then you're not really holding a moral belief. Like this could be not just a matter for defining the amoralist, but also defining what it means to be a moralist. If you have moral values um, that aren't just going to be preferences for what you want to see in the world, um, and you think there's some bindingness to them, and some kind of oughts that are involved, that there's a standard of evaluation for people's choices, then that seems to require some universality to it. That whenever someone does this, this is good. Or whenever someone does this, this is bad as long as it meets the conditions that maybe we specify in that rule. Remember, I, I remember I, I was giving you the example about treating students in different ways for late work, like this thought experiment. Is that ringing bells? Cool. Cool. Okay, awesome. All right, so now we go on a little tangent. 
and, and it's not that much of a tangent. This is still very firmly within the territory of what Williams wants to be talking about, but it's a very interesting one. Oh, man, I am I have eight minutes left of class. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, shoot. I, I got carried away with giving really nice explanations of things. Oh, man, I wanted to get through more stuff today. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to do this really, really quick. And then... I, all, all this is still just set up on defining the amoralist, and there's a particular um, recommendation that Williams wants to make about this, about how to argue with such a person, like how to answer this question, why be moral, that's really fascinating and interesting. Um, I, don't, I don't even agree with it, but it's still interesting. <laughs> it's still worth think, thinking about. It's a very interesting debate about rationality. Um, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Let's just try to finish up this stuff for today. Uh, okay, so... Remember when Williams in the in the paper starts talking about how the amoralist is a parasite? In other words, they sort of leech off of other people's goodwill for their own benefit. Like the the amoralist benefits in just personally from other people constraining their actions toward them and treating them right. Right? That they that the moralists in society aren't going to be abusive toward the amoralist, even if the amoralist is not reciprocating, right? Even if there's no quid pro quo here. Um, even if they're not on board with morality, other people are still going to treat them in a moral way if they're authentically moral. So there is kind of an asymmetry here. It doesn't seem fair. The amoralist doesn't give a shit about that because fairness is a moral concept, right? And they just, they don't, they're not moved by that. They don't see any kind of problem with it. But that's all that they can say. And where what Williams is doing in this little tangent, I think, is a fascinating way of identifying things that may look like they're amoral but are actually moral. And this is where the Joker kind of comes in again. So um, the amoralist might try to justify the asymmetry in some way or the rejection of morality. And Williams is like, they're on really thin ice if they start doing that because almost all the ways in which they might attempt to do that really end up playing the moral game again. So they wouldn't actually be an amoralist. Um, and they end up contradicting themselves, basically. Um, I actually think, as I, I originally said on the schedule I wanted to maybe start Nietzsche today, that's not going to happen. But Nietzsche is oftentimes misunderstood for this because of his own rhetoric. And Nietzsche is like, morality is dumb, blah, 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 blah. But really, he's not against morality. He's just against a certain version of morality that he's critical of. But he has his own ethical theory. He's definitely very controversial. And most people, including me, frankly, would call him an immoralist. I don't think Nietzsche has the correct moral values. We're not studying him because I think he's got moral answers. Um, I think he's wrong, but he's interestingly wrong. Um, but uh, that doesn't, just because you think he's wrong about this stuff doesn't mean, even in contra contrast to his own rhetoric, that he is somehow not playing the moral game. He is. So uh, how does this happen, in, or how can this happen, as Williams is laying out for us? Um, one of them is that um, the amoralist might fancy themselves as being better in some way than the moral masses, the sheeple who keep going along and living their lives, constrained, constraining their actions by principles of justice and compassion, and the amoralist is like, that's all bullshit, and I'm better because I see that it's bullshit, or I'm not playing into that. If they're doing that, they're probably running some kind of virtue ethic. They think there's maybe they are more free, Right? They're less encumbered than these people are playing along with the games of morality. Or they're more courageous for going against the status quo um, and bucking the trend, right? going off the grid um, where everyone else is playing on the grid of morality. Um, they might think that they're somehow more rational for this, that um, morality is just a bunch of bias and they see through the lie, something like that. Um, those, maybe you've encountered those lines before. I certainly have heard people explicitly make these arguments to me many times before, and not just on 4chan or something, but in real life. I've, I've had face-to-face -face conversations with people, some, sometimes strangers, um, who have sort of given this kind of line. Um, how many of you have heard, heard this kind of perspective before, or encountered someone who sort of argued this way?
think a common form of it for today is that people who believe in moral principles are kind of lying to themselves or are hypocrites. That, and, that, and that's part of what the Joker, this whole game, like in um, Dark Knight Rises, I think, the second one, right, with Heath Ledger, um, it's kind of like the Joker is trying to reveal the way in which people aren't really sincerely moral or how it's all just a big show it's it's only skin deep right it's superficial and it's not the real mora the real reality of human beings yeah that that sounds like it's ringing some bells okay okay so to list any of those things being more free being more courageous being more rational um, being not hypocritical um, not being deceived or biased those are all moral values they're values of virtue of I, the ideal state in which some a person should be existing and that that's supposed to guide their decisions like you should be taking action to resist biases or to be informed or to be rational or that you should have courage and people don't have courage or not doing things right um, or that freedom is important and valuable and should not be compromised for any other reason um, yeah good question Hudson uh, let's just have the code word be Joker how about that code word for today is Joker um, so I'll be the one in there yep mm -hmm. yep so um, the uh, the one way that the amoralist or the person this person is actually already an amoralist they, they are a moralist um, if they're offering these kinds of justifications for their lifestyle um, but there's another way that Williams is like yeah okay so you're already off the amoral boat if you start doing that in which case you really should just we should just go toe to toe with the arguments that now we're through the gate of why be moral and we're like okay morality matters now what does morality look like does it look like conventional morality principles of justice and compassion or does it look like other things like maybe some of the stuff Nietzsche talks about because he thinks justice is bullshit and he thinks compassion is bullshit but he still has ethical values uh, Nietzsche still is saying here's what's more ideal and less ideal and then we can have the debate about that and that's what ethics is for okay sorry you have to go um, so uh, that's what that's what ethics is for is we're sorting out those arguments our disagreements about what actually is the parameters of morality but if we're, if we're trying to have the conversation with the just the defense of morality to begin with um, there is this other kind of argument about it's not just a matter of like William says it's not just a matter of bias that people subscribe to um, moral values it's not just social conditioning or something right um, well actually that's the next point here but people want to be moral they're they they have sincere investment in it it's not just like they act moral because of fear that if they really did what they really wanted then people are gonna screw with them or something that I, I obey the laws not just because I'm afraid of the cops but because I actually value people right that I want to invest in them I don't want to mistreat them and then the person might respond yeah but that all those wants are just socially conditioned desires you've been programmed to be to have empathy and to be concerned about other people but that's not a very plausible argument either um, and I we're, we're out of time here so I probably have to cut this off but we'll pick that up tomorrow we'll talk we'll talk about social conditioning it's a very interesting argument from Williams here that I think is worth taking a look at um, and then we'll talk about Williams own very interesting um, but controversial presentation of rationality and the response to the amoralist and uh, and we'll start Nietzsche tomorrow so I'll see you then good luck with your papers and everything um, and uh, Helena and uh, who else was it? Um, uh, someone else I wanted to touch base with here. Um, here, I'll stop the video.